no one cooks the way we cook and no one has the bounty of raw ingredients that we have. So to live and cook here is not only an exceptional experience, but people worldwide know about it. As I look back on my youth, I realized the gift God gave the false family. I grew up learning how to fish, gather seafood, and cook every day of my life. Join me, Chef John Falls, as I cook up dishes honoring the age-old traditions of seafood and Louisiana's world-famous cuisine on hooks, flies, and alibis. Hooks, Lies, and Alibis is underwritten by Visit Baton Rouge, a longtime partner of this series and LPB. The capital city offers southern hospitality, cultural attractions, food, shopping, and fun. Information at visitbatonrouge.com. And by Audubon, Louisiana, working to conserve, restore, and protect important places for birds and people since 1924 and by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. Aquaculture or fish farming is nothing new. It is thought that as early as 6,000 BC, eels were raised for food in Australia. From the 13th century onward, most European abbeys and monasteries had up to three freshwater fish ponds on their grounds, eliminating the concern for having fish for fast days of Lent. Crawfish is one of our nation's biggest aquaculture crops and is second only to catfish farming. Worldwide, tilapia has become one of the most important aquaculture crops. Even Louisiana is joining the craze with farms such as Gautreaux Family Farms here in Scott, Louisiana. And here is where tilapia begins. Now what do we have here? The, uh, the way the tilapia reproduces, they don't actually breed. The female will lay her eggs on the floor of the tank. The male will come behind and fertilize them. In their mouth, they're considered mouth brooders. So the female will pick up the fertilized eggs for 21 days, hold them in her mouth, respirate, they hatch, and then once they hatch, uh, she lets them go, and that's when we harvest them. As well, what brought you into tilapia farm? I was looking for a really healthy fish, a healthy choice that we could grow here, uh, one that would uh, be, you know, suitable to fresh water. Well, hopefully I'll be able to get some little, can I get some little one and a half pounder from you for the grill? Absolutely. Let's go take a look at what the farm looks like back there. Sounds great. So Brian, here's where it all begins, right here, right? I mean, we just saw the little fry back there. Is this where they come to next? This is it. This is what we call our nursery system. Right. Where uh, we take them from Typically from half inch fish all the way up to three inch size fish. Now how long does it take to grow them from the fry we saw a minute ago into this tank and then ultimately into the tanks where you're going to be uh, harvesting them out? What is the time frame? They're, uh, they're in here for three months and then they're in there for in the, in the grow out tanks for four. So it takes roughly seven months for the more aggressive eaters up to 12 months for, for the less. Right. And what are they eating? What, what are you feeding them? Is it some type of a pellet? I notice that the, the water has a certain green yep. tint to it. Is there something here about the food as well? Yeah, we actually do feed them a protein pellet made from Menhaden uh, for their protein and their amino acids. Uh, and then we also culture plankton in the water with oh, okay. them. And that's and where that green color is coming from? That's it. That's their living salad greens, complete right. ecosystem. You've got, well, that's unbelievable. What got you into aquaculture? Why did you think this was the place for you to be? Uh, I've always been intrigued with raising fish. Grew up kind of in the swamps and in the bayous as a kid, catching fish, bringing them home to the aquarium and the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I was always interested in it. And then when I... You know, I did a little research on different species of fish and I chose tilapia because I felt they would suit our climate and everything right. better here. What's good about that fish as compared to the wild caught? You know, tilapia, as you know, they're so they're so versatile, they'll right. take on the flavor of whatever season. And you then, can't mess them up. And this guarantees availability too. I mean if I Absolutely. want a, if I want a pound and a quarter, pound and a half fish from my fire roasted grilled fish, I know I can get it. That's right. As opposed to having the 
go fishing. Right? That's right. <laughs> well, Absolutely. congratulations. This is a, a great environment to, to tour and a, certainly a nice, clean environment. And uh, we love being on the family farm. Thanks so much for sharing it with us. You're welcome, John. Good. Thank My you. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, you know, I love Bishop Munch. Uh, you know, Bishop Robert Munch is the Bishop of Baton Rouge. Even though he wears those big robes and the big hat, I, I felt no issue with inviting him to put on an apron and come to cook fish on the dock. I just absolutely love Bishop Robert Munch. Could I be more excited today on the dock here at my White Oak Plantation Lake where we're cooking fish? It's all about fish today, and how can you cook fish and not have the Bishop of Baton Rouge, Bishop Robert Munch, who we've cooked a lot together, hadn't we? Uh, yes, uh, I did a lot of watching and you did a lot of cooking and it was a good combination. <laughs> well, I'm so happy to have you with, with us today because I'm doing, I was over at Gotro Family Farms, which is just a beautiful place, a family that's so, I, I mean, this family is spectacular and they raise uh, fish and all different types of animals, but I discovered the tilapia there, and I've always been a, a big fan of tilapia because, of course, I've always heard that it was the Jesus fish, and it was the fish that, as the nets were cast onto the Sea of Galilee, and they pull them up, uh, sometimes they had a lot of tilapia, sometimes they didn't, but on occasion they were breaking the nets. And it was always fascinating to me. Then when I found out that it was such a good tasting fish, I said, it's time to put it on our menu and to cook it. So today, we're doing the Jesus fish. Wonderful. H have you ever had tilapia? Have oh, ever... of course, huh? of course. But I, I have to tell you that the first time I, I remember consciously hearing the word tilapia was about 20 years ago when I did a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Right. Uh, you know, back in those days, 20 years ago, everything was speckled trout and so on. <laughs> uh, 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 but that was my, my introduction, and, and one of the tour guides was talking about that, and uh, he said it was very uh, mild, uh, a white fish. Uh, he said it was a little bony. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's really a great, great fish, and, a, and what's good about it for the chef, there's so many other opportunities for cooking it rather than just sauteing or baking. And I want to show everybody the steam version. So right here, if you can just pick that up and bring it over to the water here for me, this is all the steamed ingredients that I'm going to use uh, on the tilapia today a little green spring onions, a little bit, of course, of, uh, of lemon, yeah, and ginger. Have a smell uh -huh. of that, huh? You can mm -hmm. smell that all the way, mm -hmm. you can smell that all the way across the uh, land here. And now, of course, a little peppercorns, and I'm gonna put a little sesame oil down in there, and I can just, you can just put that on the back table okay. right there. We'll uh, move this out of the way, and then we're gonna take that basket and, uh, and put it, I'm gonna put it right in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, the pan here and just get it starting to heat up. This is a, a bamboo wicker basket, of course, that the Asians use to do the fish. Now let's bring the tilapia up. I'm gonna put a little sake wine in here while you're doing that, a little sake, and I'm also gonna put a little touch of white wine. We can put that right down on okay, the counter very there. Good. Now let me ask you a question while we're looking at this beautiful fish. Uh, you know, uh, we do call it the Jesus fish, but Jesus started his ministry by bringing fishermen in. Right. Why did he choose fishermen instead of, uh, you, you know, when you think of the heads of the temple and you think of all of the, 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 the people who could have stood out in society, he went to the common man. Well, I think that's, you, you hit it on uh, by your description. I, uh, I think he wasn't looking for the intelligentsia, or necessarily the so-called educated, but the normal common person. and. When we read about the apostles, uh, they were normal <laughs> uh, in so many ways. They were human. They were clearly human. And sometimes they got it and sometimes they didn't. 
but somehow I think he figured if, if I can get them, if they can get the others. <laughs> well, well, you know, and his whole ministry began around the sea, which I think right. is so interesting. And of course, the fisherman uh, did, uh, was exactly what he needed, of course, and that's why, that's why he chose him. But even in the Gospels, I mean, when I think of the big stories of the Gospel, I, I, I cannot help but think about the loaves and the fishes, the multiplications. I can't help but think of him cooking that fish the third day, I think, after the right, resurrection. Right. And he's on the seashore when the apostles see him. Everything around fish. Why not lamb? Why not? You right, know, right. I, keep think, I keep going back to the fish. I'm not quite sure why. Well, he, he built it around their profession. And as you know, sometimes when they said... Um, there's, there's nothing there. If they aren't biting today, he said, yes, they are. You're, you're going to the wrong place. <laughs> and I have to believe that when he said, you know, go one more time, they were thinking to themselves, look, we do this for a living. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, and, know? you know? And they went and did and said, uh-oh. <laughs> Glad well, we listened. <laughs> well, the tilapia, the Jesus fish, we have a, a large one. This is from Gotro Farms. What a beautiful, beautiful job they do. And I have one with the black tint and one with the white. Mm -hmm. And I've seasoned it with salt, pepper inside and out. Mm -hmm. And of course, all those beautiful seasonings in that poaching water is going to season that nicely. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put it right in to the steamer. I have my steamer here and I have a little piece of ginger on top of that. It's all seasoned. I'm going to cook this for about 20 minutes until the fish is all uh, all steamed through and cooked and it's going to pick up all of that flavor. Bishop, we can put that back right over here. All right. And then we're going to make a little quick sauce here. So if you give me that, the sauce of the fish is uh, quite simple as well. I'm going to put a little ginger. There you are. You're doing pretty good. Yeah, is that right? Uh, yeah, do I you got a part-time job yeah, for the summer? Well, yeah, I, I, I promise you, you have. <laughs> I promise. Uh, a little sesame oil, a little ginger. Look at that. Wow. That's a little, uh, oh, that's a little soy sauce. Uh, green onions like that, really nice. And again, a little brown sugar in, uh, in there. And of course, uh, uh, again, a little bit of this beautiful pepper spice, and I'm going to just shake that around really, really nicely like that. And I can tell you one thing, once I discovered uh, the uh, the tilapia, once I discovered it as a, a fish, even though us in the Gulf region think of all of the great fish of the Gulf, there's no fish more plentiful, there's no fish better tasting than that fish, and no wonder they call it the Jesus fish, it's right. perfect, it's right. perfect. Now I have a little sauce already done, and I have a fish, oh my, look at this. I took one out of the steamer just a minute ago. We can put it down there, and I'm going to top it. I've already reduced some of this Asian sauce, so I'm going to put it right on top of the fish, and that meat is going to pour mm -hmm. right mm. off of that fish. You can smell how beautiful that is. Mm. Isn't that good? Too bad television can't translate aroma. <laughs> well, we try to describe it to them. I'm amazed. Where did you get my recipe from? <laughs> It was given to him in a dream at night. <laughs> Not too long ago, I was convinced to take a trip to Israel. Admittingly, I was a little skeptical about going. Security issues, long bus rides, leaving my company all plagued my mind. Ultimately, I went, and my trip to the Holy Land was a life-changing experience. My journey began in the food stalls of Carmel Market in Tel Aviv. The exotic spice displays and amazing breads and pastries and that variety of meats reminded me of the necessity to use the entire animal for food. After Tel Aviv, my pilgrimage began in earnest. The Mount of Beatitudes was striking because just beyond this site, was the location of history's first recorded catering event, the place where Jesus multiplied five loaves and two fishes to feed over 5,000 people. In Jerusalem, I stood at the Mount of Olives and I walked to Via Doloroso and visited Bethlehem just beyond the city gates. And while all of these sights were breathtaking, the most overwhelming for me was walking in Jesus' footsteps around the Sea of Galilee. I was stunned to learn that the Sea of Galilee was only seven miles wide and 15 miles long, roughly the same size as our Lake Desalman, where I grew up. It was here that I roasted tilapia on the seashore with our pilgrimage leader, Jeff Cavins. So, uh, uh, so Jeff, we're, uh, we're standing back on the Sea of Galilee, and of course, 
fishing and uh, fish has such an important part in biblical stories and parables. Jesus used them constantly to tell the stories of uh, of life. And one uh, one in particular, one of the greatest stories of the Bible is the, the story of the loaves and the fishes. And that happened just just right around the corner uh, here, right? It did. It happened on the uh, northern shores of the Sea of Galilee at a place today called Tabga. Uh, just uh, just west of Capernaum. And uh, Jesus had gathered 5,000 plus people on the northern shores. He'd been teaching them. And at the end of the day, the disciples noticed that they were tired, they were hungry, and their solution was to send them away. And Jesus said, you give them something to eat. Now, these are fishermen, and they don't have a whole lot. But he said, you give them something to eat. They realized they didn't have anything. And he said, what do you have? And they found five loaves with a little boy and two fish, like what we have here. And they gave it to Jesus, and he blessed, and he, he multiplied it. He gave it back to the disciples and told them to feed the people. And uh, lo and behold, it, it, it kept multiplying and multiplying. We don't know exactly how, but he ended up feeding the 5,000 and had 12 baskets left over. And that happened just on the northern shores right around the corner. Well, now, you know, we're, we're, we're here in a setting probably uh, typical of what Jesus would have uh, or what the apostles, I guess, would have seen on the third time that Jesus appeared to them after the, uh, uh, the resurrection. And he was cooking his breakfast, a breakfast of fish, and probably it was tilapia, right? I would guess it is because it's, uh, it's so rich with tilapia. These are tilapia, these fish here. And, um, and this is what uh, a lot of people would have eaten for their protein. Uh, and then as a cook, I mean, I cannot help but, uh, but be just uh, enthralled with the stories of food around the Sea of Galilee and fishing. And so many stories was revolved around food. As I said, Jesus cooking his own breakfast. Mm -hmm. Why do you think food, fishing, was the, the majority of the stories told? Was that just a, a, the ability to identify? Well, this is a, a rural setting. So when he talks about the, the lilies of the valley, or he talks about wheat, and he talks about leaven, he talks about fish, uh, water, springs, all of this is part of his classroom. And that's one of the advantages of coming to Israel, is that you get to come over to his classroom, and suddenly the props make sense. Well, you know, as a, as a chef, uh, uh, being able to come to this place after hearing all of the stories, and certainly walking in the place where the, uh, where the multitudes met, and then being on the shores of the sea, cooking our own breakfast, breakfast this morning. I'm not sure we, it's going to be ready for us in a minute here. I'm patient. <laughs> but Jeff, thanks so much for being with us and thanks so much for guiding this beautiful this journey that good. you've taken us all on. And uh, wow, it's been an unbelievable experience. Thank you so much. On to Jerusalem. <laughs> on to Jerusalem. Traveling to Israel was a long journey, but the experience has left an indelible mark on my soul. And today I'm a changed man because of it. Just as Jesus calmed the waters on the Sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago, you can calm those hunger pangs on any stormy night with this delicious fish soup. You, you know, I remember exactly, it was my recipe. And remember we talked about we were having breakfast. Your recipe, no, it was at the Catholic Life Center in the auditorium we were talking yeah, about. I, I, oh, uh, oh, oh, how oh, y'all oh, doing, everybody? <laughs> but but I, I'll let you take credit for it, I mean, you know. <laughs> No, no problem. Every, every time anybody asks me whose recipe it is, I said the bishop, of course. Huh? They won't, won't buy the book or eat at the restaurant. Anyway, we're going to cook it for you right now. It's a stormy night fish soup. That's the name of it. And look at this pot. It's we're, ready to we're, go. We're really cooking. Now, I'm going to put a little bit of my buttery flavored oil in here. This is a this is a vegetable oil that has a great butter flavor. And I like to get my cast iron pots hot first. That way when you pour the oil in, we're ready to cook. Now what we're going to do, again, we're going back to that beautiful tilapia. We're going back to the beautiful Jesus fish. And uh, uh, this, uh, this fish, of course, lends itself to picking up so many different flavors. And this is a perfect soup for those folks who like something, I'm going to say light, although I'm adding a little cream to it. But you can leave the cream out if you're, um, I don't know, maybe non-Louisianian. <laughs> <laughs> so you're ready to go. Let me show you what I have here to begin with. You can pick that up. Sure. I have a little onion, celery, bell pepper. Of course, I have jalapeno for spice. It's a little Spanish influence. Carrots. And then, of course, broccoli, cauliflower, potatoes as a thickener. And look at the garlic here. Mm. You know this is good, huh? Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now into the pot with the potatoes. Now I'm gonna put, you notice I'm putting the broccoli and cauliflower into the pot. Uh, and you can just put that down. Or you can put it on the back table if you want to right there. 
I'm, uh, I'm just kind of, look, look how beautiful this uh, is. Huh? You know, you can really tell that this is going to be a good dish just by looking at it uh, uh, right here. All of those beautiful flavors gone into it. Now, you know, uh, you and I were talking uh, 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 earlier today about that early Greek symbol that went over the doors. That was such an interesting story. Ichthus was right. uh, ichthus, uh, and I kept saying, "What is ichthus?" And right. and uh, you you brought it around. Uh, well, uh, it is an acronym, a Greek acronym, Jesus Christ, Son of God. And by using the fish, uh, people who were not understanding what it meant did not realize these were Christians. This was their symbol of Jesus, and so they could kind of get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, those, those were not supporting th them. Those were really trying times, oh, though, my. for the early Christians. Oh, I mean, the persecutions oh. and all. I mean, uh, what what was it? What what was it that that kept those generations so far away from uh, from the Christian movement? I mean, was it just their own pagan influences? Well, or? you know, uh, religion is is not just a simple thing, and people who really hold on to a religion, which you're supposed to a, a, a faith, a lived faith. Uh, and and so everybody was holding on to whatever there there was, right, right. and when when something comes to change that that can get a little right, uh, right. tricky. Well, and we see in the world today is so much of the strife and so much of the problems we have are all in some way based around or influenced by religions, and right. it's, uh, everybody's fighting for God. It seems like well, in some in some way or their God, and, and and not necessarily using the methodology of others, but the commitment of others. We can sometimes learn. <laughs> <laughs> you can, uh, oh, you can believe that. Right. Uh, now I'm putting a little flour into it. Uh, like this and stirring that around just to blend because this is a white roux. I'm making a white sauce with this uh, uh, with this uh, uh, fish and and if you slide that over a little bit again I was talking about the Gautreau family they, they're so inspiring to me the work that they do as a family and what really inspires me is to go there and see how all the children and everybody they grow this fish and that makes it just so much better for me as a cook to know where my ingredients come from so I'm going to hold that out okay. I'm putting this in in, and you can stir that for me, sure. uh, and I'm going to add this uh, fish stock. I have a little fish stock here that was made from the bones of this uh, tilapia. Once I uh, filleted it, I was able to, uh, let me go ahead and pour the stock in. It's going to make it easier to stir, mm -hmm. and you can just mm -hmm. stir that around a little bit, and I think you're going to see it all come together nicely. You know, something I never realized, it not only looks good and smells good, but it sounds good. <laughs> it sounds good, that, that, <laughs> that, that bubbling, and, that bubbling right. sound. You know, one other thing that I wanted to, to just mention to you, it seems that daily throughout the generations, God has left little messages along the way. We don't have to look too hard to find the path. It's always there. Well, I was in Galilee just recently, and here was the fisherman's boat that they found after, what, 2,000 years. And they know that it was probably a boat that was of the same era as the apostles. Now, why would that boat be there other than to bring about the whole stories of the men of Galilee, I think, right? Really, really inspiring. I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of salt a little bit but look how beautiful that is huh now go ahead and dump the rest of that right down in here you can you got it. i'll take this and you can just i'm gonna put the rest of my broccoli my cauliflower a couple of lemons and i'll let this cook but let me tell you what i have some let's walk over to that bowl right there and you can just take that little lid off there you go and i want you to see what this looks like mm. uh, <laughs> Does that look, huh? You know what this, huh? You talk about a, a gift from the Sea of Galilee. Take a look at this, huh? Uh, Rich, that is called supper in Louisiana. Huh? <laughs> and I'll just decorate this. And y'all, we're going to sample this while you go away. When you come back, one more dish to serve. Fruit punch, refreshing and at once intoxicating. Don't let the sweetness fool you. It goes down easy, but it's going to sneak up on you. All right, y'all have a little stormy night. This is just a good punch. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful little uh, cooler, and I'm going to give one to you. Y'all, you know who these folks are. The Gotro family, just some of the children. And, of course, thank y'all so much for that beautiful tilapia y'all supplied to us. What a beautiful place y'all have. Thank you. Good. Hey, y'all take a sip. Bishop, 
There it is right there. And y'all, one more dish, one more dish we promised you. This is a triple decker tilapia club sandwich. It's got bacon on it. It's got a little bit of avocado, of course, lettuce, tomatoes. Well, I should say a lot of bacon. <laughs> <laughs> but it's made in your honor. It's either a triple layer cake or a sandwich, whatever there you want. You go. And of course, all kind of fixings. Anyway, y'all, it's been great. That Bishop, thanks so much so for being candy, here. Chef. Uh, I couldn't think of anybody else to cook the Jesus dish with <laughs> since well, I got it from you. them, huh? Amen. And by Amen. the way, you did a good job in that recipe. I think it was mine. No, no, no. You, you just. I don't even want to hear it, y'all. Uh, y'all, thanks bit. so much for <laughs> stopping by the camp today. When it comes to fresh fish and seafood, there's no place like Louisiana Sports and Paradise. So you know what? See you next time for another tasty edition of Hooks, Lies, and Alibis. Here, here. Hey. There you go. Hooks, Lies, and Alibis is underwritten by Visit Baton Rouge, a longtime partner of this series and LPB. The capital city offers southern hospitality, cultural attractions, food, shopping, and fun. Information at visitbatonrouge.com. And by Audubon, Louisiana working to conserve, restore, and protect important places for birds and people since 1924. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. For a copy of John Fulce's cookbooks and more, call the number on your screen or visit www.lpb.org slash Fulce.